Well, good morning, everyone. Or afternoon, I guess it is. Boy, I tell you, um, as, as I was preparing for this, I didn't know what it would look like. There's a lot of uncertainty in um, even just gathering and being together. And um, you know, today's probably going to feel a little bit different, um, but the Lord is with us here today. And it is just so exciting to be to be able to, to join and worship with you corporately for the first time. And so, um, yeah, let's just uh, let's stand and we'll get started. All right. So this first song is the Rising Sun, and to kick it off, um, we're going to be reading Psalm 148, 1 through 13. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, highest heaven, and He waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded that they were created. He set them in position forever and ever. He gave an order that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, all sea monsters and ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and cloud, powerful wind that executes His command, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animal and all cattle, creatures that crawl and flying birds, kings of the earth and all people all judges of the earth, young men as well as young women, old and young together, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted, his majesty covers the heaven and the earth.
the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And as Aaron said, there's a lot of craziness going on in our world today. But Jesus, he said, in this world we will have trials, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And so this morning, in the midst of all this craziness, we have hope. We have a living hope, and his name is Jesus. And so I want to invite you guys to sing this next song with us. It's called Living Hope. And how great the chasm that lay between us And how high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turn to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And then through the darkness, your loving kindness it tore through the shadows of my soul. And the work is finished, and the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Who could imagine so great a mercy? And what heart could fathom such boundless grace? And the God of ages stepped down from glory. To bear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken and I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, and I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ. I will be We sing this out. And hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. And hallelujah. Cause death has lost its grip on me. And you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ. My living. Christ, 
verses one to ten. We're going to look at three sub points, and you can grab some uh, grab some notes and, and write down these three sub points: refuge, response, and rescue. Now, I've enjoyed having other people read uh, scripture uh, for us, so I've invited our very own Shanna Go. If y'all give a round of applause for Shanna Go. Shanna's going to read Exodus 2, verses 1 to 10. So take it away. Uh, you can use the stand if you need. This is my friend. Just seconds away from my Okay. Uh, now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him from th for three months. But when she could find him no longer, when she could hide him no longer, she got a wicker basket and covered it with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to find out what happened to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile with her maidens walking along the, the Nile. And she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid, and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the boy was crying. And she had pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you for, from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you her wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. The child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses and said, Because I drew him out of the water. Awesome. You hold on to the mic. Take all that with you. Thank you so much. Y'all give a round of applause for Shannon. Thank you so much, Shannon. Now, I know that, uh, well, I hope, I hope that you've seen the greatest animation movie of all time. It's called Prince of Egypt. Amazing. Like, watch it tonight if you've never seen it. It's life-changing. But even if you have seen it, we still need to take some time to draw out some background in the, in the book of Exodus. So just to, just big picture with me, when, when you look at, the Bible starts off with Genesis. Genesis, uh, we're in the Old Testament's first book of the Bible. And the children of Israel, they're coming to Egypt because there's a famine in the land. So that in Exodus, the second book of the Bible, Exodus, the Israelite population is exploding. And the Egyptians started to feel a little uncomfortable with all these Israelites. Right? They started to uh, 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 kind of clash, cultures clashing together. You know, isn't that surprising? to think about cultures clashing together, right? Egyptian culture and the, uh, the Hebrew culture, the Israelites, right? Man, I thought the Bible was so outdated and unrelatable. And right here in Exodus 2, cultures are clashing. You need to know that when you look on the news today and you see, you see tension in our country, uh, that's not unique just to black people and, and white people. That, that's, a, that's a problem that starts in Genesis chapter through and it ripples through all of Humanity. Like if you go to Western Europe right now, Asia, India, Russia, like I mean, cultures clashing with cultures is not unique. And that's what we see right there in Exodus chapters 1 and 2. Uh, so that the Pharaoh of Egypt says, these Israelites are too numerous. We've got to do something about it. You don't want to start off with tension. You know they probably like being around each other. Everybody likes something new. Like, you know, being around like, all different instruments that the Israelite, the shofar, the Egyptians were like, that's so cool. The Israelite bringing some dill into their recipe. Like, what is that? Is that that's so nice. But then it starts exploding in population, rubbing against each other. There's friction. So the Pharaoh says, verse 9, I want you to hold, hold God's word in your hand. Just don't rely on the screen. He says, we need to deal with these Israelites. Because eventually we might get into battle and, and they might side with the enemy. So in Exodus chapter 1, the Egyptians placed masters over the Israelites. They forced the Israelites into slavery. And then the Pharaoh gives an order to Egyptian midwives to slaughter, to terminate every newborn Israelite boy. 
that's that's the backdrop as, as we break in to Exodus. And that leads us to our, our first sub point, which is refuge. And the word refuge means a shelter of protection. In Exodus 2, we see incredibly dark moments of humanity coming to the surface, but the God of Scripture is bringing a shelter of protection. Now write that in your notes. Do you, do you hear the shelter? Do you, do you see God's fingerprints already? Right, the Pharaoh is the highest power in the land. Right? He is God in the flesh to the Egyptian people. And he has given an order to the Egyptian midwives, women that would help Israelites birth new babies. He's given them an order to slaughter every Israelite baby boy. And the Egyptian midwives ignore, ignore the Pharaoh's orders and instead fear the God of Scripture and obey the God of Scripture. That's the hand of God working to bring a shelter of protection. In Exodus 2, we see another rock star woman, Moses' mom. You see that in verse 1, verse 2? The woman bore a son. Well, that must have been terrifying. And the order has gone out. No doubt she spent nine months, like, worried. Like, what if? What if we have a baby boy? What are we going to do? They didn't have, like, what's that called? Sonar? Radar? What is that? They didn't have ultrasounds back then. Like, she just, nine months. Like, what are we going to, what are we going to, and then he's born, and it's a boy. Like, oh, yeah, oh, wow. Like, how, how are we going to keep him safe for three months? They're, 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 Worried, like how are we going to keep him alive? How do we make sure he doesn't get captured by the authorities? And the hand of God is working to bring a shelter of protection. In Exodus two, the Pharaoh is swinging. Pharaoh of Egypt, he's swinging blows of death, destruction. He's just trying to make a dent. And it's like the God of Scripture is like the big brother. It just puts his hand on his head. I had a big brother, seven years older. I come at him swinging, and he just like palm my head, and I'm just swinging in the air, like swinging, and nothing is landing. That's what's taking place in Exodus one and two. And the God of Scripture is bringing a shelter of protection. But so I know right now it might be hard to see God's hand at work. When you're scrolling through your, your timeline and, and you see a video of George Floyd being murdered, like I get it. It's hard. It's hard to, to see his hand in those dark moments. The COVID-19 is exhausting. But the God of Scripture is working. He's working in Exodus 1 and 2. He's working right now. And, and you might push back. You say, Michael, I don't know. Are you sure? Just look at God's word. But Verse 3, mom places three-month-old baby Moses in a basket on the Nile. It's like the mighty Mississippi. Like, this is not like a stream. And Moses' sister, verse 5, Moses' sister guides that baby to the place where the Egyptian women are bathing. And then the daughter of Pharaoh finds him, verse 6, and has pity on the baby. Circle that word Pity. It sounds condescending, but in the Hebrew language, in the original language, that word pity is the word compassion. And so the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Egypt is spewing hatred. Slaughter those newborn Israelite baby boys. Let's let, let's you know there's slurs just flying out of his mouth. And yet the daughter of the Pharaoh looks upon this Hebrew baby boy and has compassion. And in verse 7, Moses' sister asked the Pharaoh's daughter, hey, should we get a Hebrew woman to raise this baby? Yeah, let's do that. It's a good idea. It's good thinking. Let's get a Hebrew woman to raise this little baby Hebrew boy. And look at his split. Moses' sister gets Moses' mom. And she's back with her baby. Like, come on. What's the God of Scripture bringing refuge, a shelter of protection? And if you're here today, if you're wondering, like, can the God of Scripture work in dark moments? If you're scrolling through that timeline, like, can, is he moving right now? Like, if you're wondering if the God of Scripture sees your pain and, and whatever it is that's going on in 
in your life, if you're thinking like, how, how long can we cry out in, in sorrow and lament? How long, O oh Lord? And yet we see the God of Scripture is bringing refuge. The king of Egypt is hell-bent on oppression, and the sovereign hand of God is at work providing refuge. Psalm 57, David hiding in caves. He writes, to God, most high, to the one who accomplishes all things for me. Yes, the God of Scripture is at work. Romans 8, the Apostle Paul writes, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him. Therefore, let us walk as men and women who are holding tightly to the one who brings refuge. You with me? And then I'll, I'll see his eyebrows. Y'all gotta make those eyebrows bop, you know, just like give me some good eyebrow action. Y'all gotta make a clap. I'll take that also. That, that's, our, that's our first sub point is refuge. Let's get our second sub point, which is response. In our second sub point, we, we want to ask how are we supposed to respond to one another as we walk through these dark moments? It's easy to read Exodus 1 and 2. Say to ourselves, wow, man, the God of Scripture is at work. That's awesome. Uh, but like, what was it like for the relationships to one another? You think about that? Like, how do we navigate these dark seasons of our world, like in our relationships with one another? How did they respond? Like, can you imagine what that conversation was like for Moses' mom and dad? Like in that moment, gut wrench, earth shaking, like, oh my God, you're pregnant? Okay, okay. What are we gonna do? You know, like, well, you know, just like, just brainstorm, and then it's born. It's a, it's a boy? Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Oh, how are we gonna keep him alive? Like, shh, like, babies cry a lot. Like, what if the neighbors, like, you know, she's always watching, you know, she's gonna, you know, and then, like, here, then one spouse at some point is like, I got an idea. Okay, what if, stay with me now. What if we take this wicker basket and we put some tar and pitch and put it on the Nile? What if? What if we did that? Like, what do you think the other spouse was like? Oh, oh, okay. So now we're just throwing babies in the river. Like, I was like, what? Are, you know that was complicated. You know that was messy. You know, it wasn't as simple as a couple of verses in chapter two. Like, that was the That's where they are. Can you imagine the Egyptian midwives? The order has gone out. Hear ye, I don't know what it was like. The order goes out. Slaughter babies. Midwives are like, that's me. Like, oh gosh. Uh, they're working with Israelite women. They're like, and they start thinking, like, imagine the seeds of those first thoughts, like, And so they start maybe bouncing off another Egyptian midwife walking around the pyramids. I don't know. Were they around there again? And uh, one of them says, just throws out like, hey, did you see that order? You know, <laughs> did you see that? It's like, what do we, yeah, what if we didn't? What? What did you just say? Like, I don't know. Like, you know, like, how did she like, what if we, like, what, what if we, ugh. what if we, no. <laughs> like looking around and thinking like, what if we ignored the Pharaoh's orders? Like, can you imagine what that must have been like? Like, that's where we are. Like, I'm sure, I'm, like, it wasn't clean and concise. And but I can tell you, like, one of the biggest obstacles for us right now, like as a church family, in your individual family, in your circle of friends, is like, how do we keep strong relationships with one another? Our responses with one another. It's one thing to go through an individual crisis. But we have people to lean on, systems to help us, people that aren't in it. Right now, everybody's in it. Everybody's in it, and it's going to be a strain. And I, I think one of the biggest attacks on our relationships right now is this either-or mentality that we see in our culture, talking about COVID-19 and the black community and race and slavery and police brutality and our president and our economy, like, have you, you, it's either or. Have you felt that? Like, you can't, like it's, it's, you gotta be, up, you're one or the other. There's no room for in between. 
There's no room for processing. There's no room for like my thoughts are still developing. And you gotta be either or. You're either for President Trump or you're a bigot. Like which camp are you in? And so we can move you like you're either for an organization supporting black lives or you're a racist. Like which one is it? Like do, I just need to know like how can I categorize you? You're either for wearing masks or you don't care about people's lives. You don't care about people living. Okay. There's no in between. You're either for defunding the police or you're for police brutality. And it's just like sweeping through us right now. And the purpose is to divide, the purpose is to segregate, the purpose is to tear down and it's destructive. It's destructive to our church family. It's destructive to our individual families. It's destructive to our friendships. I mean, I think, can we just acknowledge that we might need a minute? Like, can we just acknowledge, like, I just learned about defund the police like a week ago. I didn't even know that was a thing. I, I hear it. I'm just like, that's, that's crazy. What does that even mean? Like, I, we need a minute. Before we start kind of posting, like, having, like, this is where I stand, like, just like we need some time. Can we acknowledge that these conversations are complex? Like that they're not simple? That, that, that human beings need time to form thoughts? That we're probably not given the, the, the most insight off the cuff? Can we acknowledge that? Like we just gotta acknowledge this either or is destructive to our relationships with one another. That human beings are walking contradictions. Like we have like contradictions in us, like in, in all life. Like be very excited about working out, sweating, and then go eat a cheeseburger and then get a Diet Coke. You know, like just like is that, like what? And it's forcing people. Right now our culture is either or is forcing, like you said this, you posted this, well this means you must be, and so you, boom, now that's where it's destructive. So here's what it looks like practically. Someone posts something on social media, this either or mentality shows up. Hashtag Black Lives Matter. The impulse, somebody sees that, we see that in our timeline, and we just have this like conditioning, this either or, of like, well, if you're saying Black Lives Matter, I guess that you, you don't think all lives matter. And if I'm not black, I guess you don't care about me, and so I gotta put you in this camp and we can't be friends. Like it's that, it's that quick. Somebody's posted something about. President Trump, something positive about President Trump. It could happen, right? Something positive about President Trump. And then immediately we're like, well, President Trump, he's for this wall. He's against immigrants. Well, I got immigrants in my family lineage, so I guess that we can't be friends. I guess we gotta cut each other off because you must be this type of person. It's destructive. Is it possible that we're developing thoughts? Is it possible that we're still learning that we need a minute? Is it impossible that social media is the worst platform to communicate and learn these things? Like, I'm not saying social media is of the devil. It's pretty horrible, though. Like, it's just not, I'm not sure how helpful it is. I just think that's something we need to think about in our relationships with one another, and it's, maybe it's not, it's, it's not wicked, but I, I just think we, we honestly, we're kind of, we're just kind of going throughout our day, and we just kind of jump online, social media, and we're just kind of scrolling our timeline, and I think in the moment, we're just kind of like, well, dog, this is kind of fun, and, and we don't realize that we're walking through a field of landmines, like, bam, bam, explosion, bomb, shrapnel, and then we get to the end of our day, and we're like, like, I'm anxious, and I'm like, why are I snapping at people? And I, I don't know, what, what, we've been walking through a field of landmines all day. Now, uh, I know some of us uh, are going to push back. Well, it might have been so much error out there. we got to stand for biblical truth. There is. There's a lot of error out there, and I agree. We do need to stand for biblical truth, but let's also acknowledge that it's not brave or noble to, to like, like and follow, right? I mean, that's fair, right? Nobody in the history of, 
throat is going to be like, did you see that young lady? I mean, the way she liked that man, oh, stirs up in me. You know what's brave? It's brave to have conversations with somebody. It's brave to see these conversations or these, these subjects going around our, our culture right now, our world right now, and instead move toward one another and have a conversation. It's brave to get face to face, mask to mask, or Zoom to Zoom, phone to phone, whatever, and talk. That's brave. It's brave to hear someone's story, to take the time to invest in their story. That's brave. If you look at me, 45-year-old white male, like you're just going to make assumptions. And you don't know, I grew up in a divorced home, alcoholic father, and bounced around different schools every year. You don't know that unless you hear, hear the story. But we do. We make that adjust, adjustments on each other. Just thought, we got to hear it's brave to get to know one another. It's brave to share a thought. Somebody disagree with that thought. Not slam your hands on the table and say, because I said so. But instead, hear their perspective, and in the process, sharpen and grow. That's brave. That's brave. And I'm sure some of us are going to say, Mike, well, I've tried that. I tried that. I tried that one time, and it was horrible. I started crying. It was very exhausting. We didn't make any progress. Yeah. It's, it's messy. I'm guessing it was messy in Exodus 1 and Exodus 2. It's complicated, it's frustrating, it's confusing. But I think that's the bravery. That's the invitation for our church family. And we're, we're going to hang on and how to respond to our relationships with one another. And that's the invitation. And it's not an easy invitation, I get it. Like we're not the most diverse church in the world, but the Lord has blessed us with some diversity. And most churches, church families, everybody looks alike, talks alike, looks alike, does alike. We got some differences. We got we got some different ethnicities. We got different political views, different age, season of life. But we have we have some opportunities to rub against each other, right? And you might not be ready for it. I just tell you that on the front end. Like you might not be ready for it. You might need to go find your people, I guess. Like go find people who vote like you, look like you, talk like you. But but the invitation for our church family. Is that, that the gospel is stirred up in us so greatly that we're so in awe of Jesus that it, that, that it washes over us just a, a position of, of humility and a commitment to one another to work through these types of conversations. And you know what? Sometimes we're going to go to the scriptures and we're going to say, like, that's not what the Bible teaches. We'll do that. We've done that before. We are fine doing that. And, and, and we're going to say, look, you either got to get on with God's word and you're going to have to move on someplace else. We, we, might, we might need to do that. And, and, and that's okay. But if we do that, then let's do that in such a way that we're full of humility with one another, that we're full of grace with, with one another, we're full of kindness with one another. And even if they walk away from us, that they, they, they might say, like, you know what? I, I, I didn't see what it I didn't agree with what they were saying, but they were kind. They were gracious. They were understanding. That's, that's the invitation for our church family. How do we respond in these difficult seasons that we would be a city on a hill, that we would be a light, that we would be a signpost of heaven? Is I don't care if you vote for Trump, if you're Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative. I don't care. I care about the glory of Jesus being stirred up in us in such a way that it changes how we treat one another. And by God's grace, that's happening. Like there's stories every week right now where this is being lived out. And people are sharing thoughts. And I don't agree and sitting down and talking it out. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's the response for us, church family. Y'all want to do that with me, don't you? Let's look at this last level. Okay, we're not going to go a little long today. We haven't been together in a while, right? right? We gotta make up. I know you spent some videos here and there. But we got some time to make up, like get, get together. This is fun. This is the, this is the last one. It's a short, 
It's called rescue. But you listen to all that about response and, and see we need to be rescued. I, I, I need to be rescued. I don't know how to do what I just described to you in the second sub line. Dude, I need to be rescued. We get to the end of Exodus 2, and, and the Lord has done all these amazing things and all these chaotic moments. And it's really clear that Moses needs a rescue. Moses has grown up in this dual life. He's, he's Hebrew, he's Israelite. He's grown up in an Egyptian culture. You know that's challenging. And what, what must it have been like for him? And he's experiencing all the benefits of that Egyptian culture. He's in the palace. He's being educated. He's getting position. He's getting opportunity. And what, what Moses does, he, he, he ventures out of the palace into the people. And he doesn't take advantage of all that position and power. And instead, he takes the life of an Egyptian soldier, right? And he's filled with so much shame, so much fear, so, so, so much guilt that he flees out into the desert. He runs for it, right? And maybe for some of us right now, we're like, I'd like to flee. I'd like to get off into the desert. No doubt you feel a little overwhelmed right now. You feel that tension. And I'm not talking about like on a global level, on a personal level, just things going on in us. Things with our career, things with our children, things with our marriage, things with our finances, and we're just like, oh, I gotta get out of here. So you, you need to know, you need to know that, that longing we have to run, to flee into the desert, you need to know that that is the Spirit of God calling you out and getting to his rescue. You just need to know that that, that, that feeling of just like, I'm tired, I give up, I want to I, I I get away, I want to I want to run, like that, that's the spirit of God working in you, that like, you, you weren't meant to handle all this, you need a rescuer, that's the spirit of God inviting you to himself. Even the minorities in our church family, ethnically minority or Politically, in the minority, or the financial minority, like there, there, there might be a stirring in you, like man, this is hard, this is difficult. I just want to kind of get away with my people, so I don't have that. This is what I want you here. Our elders want you here. We love diversity. We love it. We love, we love all the different, all the, all the glory of God just showing up in different spiritual gifts and color of skin. It's just like popping with His goodness and glory. Like, we love it. We want you to stay. That longing you have to run. To get away. And that's the Spirit of God calling you to Himself. You need a rescuer. That's not unique to being in a minority position. That's all of humanity. We need a rescuer. His name is Jesus. Like Moses, Jesus was born at a, at a time where infant baby boys were being pursued unto death. But unlike Moses, that when Moses steps out of the palace into the people, he ends up taking a lot. You see, but when Jesus steps out of the palace, out of that heavenly realm, into our world with the people, he ends up laying down his life. Right? Because Jesus didn't just come to rescue us from, from physical chains, right? He didn't come just to deliver, to deliver us from physical slavery. He came to conquer sin and death. He came to make us alive. And he's, he's calling us to himself right now. And you're watching online, you're watching in a video three days later. Like I just want you to, like, the God of Scripture is working in your life to call you to himself. I want you to respond you're here today, that longing you have to run, that's the Spirit of God inviting you into his rescue, turn to Jesus. Confess your need for Jesus. Confess that you're fearful and overwhelmed and exhausted. He's a rescue. He's an eternal rescue. Won't you, won't you respond? Will you bow your heads with me?
Father in heaven, it's good to be back. It's good to, to, to be with our church family in person, to be with our church family online, and we thank you for such a timely piece of scripture today. I pray that, that every one of us are, are running to your word, that in times of crisis, in times of challenges, the, the word of God is like, like, like water to our souls. Let us run. We'll hear it differently. We'll feed on it differently. And so let us, let us do that. We thank you for doing that in Exodus 1 and 2 already. Thank you for the reminder of the refuge and the shelter and the protection that you provide. Help us to see that. Help us to be so overwhelmed by your shelter of protection that it changes our relationships with one another. That there's just a little more humility, there's just a little more patience, there's a little more commitment to get in the, in the meat and in the, in the, in the challenges of these conversations today. That our church family could be a light. That when the rest of the world is tearing each other apart and segregating and dividing and isolating, that North Village Church would be a light, a signpost of heaven where men and women are sharpening one another, encouraging one another, challenging one another, and growing in you. We thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name. Will you guys stand and sing this with us?
lead us where we're at, Lord. And help us to understand what's going on today in our world, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Hey, if you're joining us uh, here today or online, we're so glad you're joining us at North Village Church. And uh, I know it's a little different, but it's so awesome to be meeting again and seeing faces, even with masks on. And uh, so glad you're here today. And a few things that uh, I want to talk about because it's been some months. But um, I, we are so proud of our worship team and Jeffrey, your leadership of the team. Thank you, guys. They have been so fluid and flexible. You wouldn't believe what they have done. They've, they've been at our office to, to produce music. They've been at Billwood Baptist to produce music. And they're here today producing music and worship for us. So thank y'all so much. And also, there's many other people behind the scenes. John Anderson uh, does all of our Sunday programming. And, um, you know, we've, we've had to learn a lot of things over the past several months. Uh, Michael has done a fantastic job with uh, navigating all this technology. And uh, we thank you so much for Dustin Rogers and Marijuana for Smiley because they've done a lot of video editing. And there's just so many people that think. And, it, and it's, it's so cool that we're part of a church where everyone gets involved. And uh, another thing I want to kind of... Uh, Pat some guys on the back. So, what do James Gordon, Mayron Fort Smalley, and Nathan Holman have in common? Everybody? <laughs> yes, they are all me. <laughs> okay, they form the basic uh, elements of our marketing team. And I don't know if y'all had a chance to look at our new website. They worked on it for several months, and it launched last month, and it's awesome. So I hope that you, let's give them a hand. Also, did y'all know that Kaylee Bean is in the house? Taylor's in that way. It is our youth village intern during this summer. And we had a meet and greet for her a couple of weeks ago. She had some fun games for us. She led our youth time on Saturday. So good to have you here, Kaylee. And I'm looking forward to what your investment is going to mean for our youth, for our teens this summer. So, uh, so glad to have you. A couple other, other announcements that we have. If you've been thinking about theological training in the fall, I would just say do it. You'll be glad you did. We're going to go deep into scripture, and we're going to read some awesome books together. Uh, you have uh, the deadlines coming up, July 1st. You want to come on board with us be thinking about that. Now let me uh, pray, pray, pray for us as we think about giving. We're not going to pass a basket today. We don't want to spread any germs. If you'd like to give, you can put uh, your check on the counter back there. Uh, we really encourage uh, online giving during the COVID period. So go online, go on the round, set up giving if you'd rather go that black route. But uh, let's thank God for his provision. Lord, you're awesome. This morning, just thinking about, oh, I'm sorry, this actor did. I am so mixed up. But just thinking about each day with just the confusion out there that, uh, that you're ready to rescue us. Lord, that you're our refuge, that we can just, uh, we can put our life in your hands and we can rest in peace knowing, each day knowing that you're our refuge and that you're also our rescue. And I just pray, Lord, that when we're just kind of going through just some of the challenges of the day, maybe our emotions get going too, too greatly with the things that are going on in the news. That, we can just focus, we can just lean back on your shoulders and just know that you're there to rescue us. Thank you so much, God, for this time together in your name.